Revelation. Well, we're told in, from the very get-go, chapter 1, verse 1, it is what? Revelation. The revealing of Jesus Christ to the churches, or to his church. So he's revealing himself to us. It's not about setting dates or identifying creatures and that. As you remember, last week we were in uh, chapter 4, and we were ushered into the throne room of God. And we, we talked about uh, how we see all of these wonderful beings and creatures and angels and elders and, and uh, we didn't identify a single one of them, if you remember right. So what did we get out of the chapter? We got what they were doing and what were they all doing? They were worshipping, weren't they? They were all gathered around the throne and they were all worshipping. And so, what we took away from that, I would hope, is that as God's creatures, as His creation, when we are ushered into His presence, our reaction, our response, should automatically be to fall down and worship Him. Now, we won't literally fall down, maybe, depending on our, our personalities and, and how we, we uh, demonstrate our worship, but we will at least figuratively fall down before him and cast whatever we have at his feet and say, here it is, God. Use it. You gave it to me, and now I'm giving it back to you. That's the kind of response being in God's presence should elicit from us. So this whole book is his revealing himself to his church, that's us, and how we should respond to it. When we read the book of Revelation, it shouldn't be with uh, the goal of seeing what's going to happen in the future, though that's in there, but it should be the goal of how is this going to affect my life? How is this going to change me? How is this going to reveal to me more about what Jesus Christ is like? And I hope that's what we're doing as we go through here. Last week, as we were ushered into the throne room, uh, we took notice that entrance into that room is by invitation only. By invitation only. There was no way John could have propelled himself into that room. But you remember, behold, I looked and a door was opened unto me. And who opened the door? Jesus. He's the only way into the throne room of God is through Jesus Christ. And you remember what he said to the church of Philadelphia back in chapter 3? He says, I have opened a door for you that no man can close. Nobody can keep you out of that throne room once Jesus opens the door and the Spirit calls you in. That's really good news, isn't it? And that's another thing we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. We have the gospel repeated over and over and over. The good news that God has prepared a place and Jesus opens the way into that place and the Spirit calls us to move into that place. All through the Gospel of John, we, we hear that Jesus describes himself as the door. And so he is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no man enters into the presence of God but through me. And that's good news. So what does John find when he enters God's presence? He finds all of these marvelous creatures. And, and you remember we talked a little bit about how, how cool it would be if they would make a movie the way they can do special effects and stuff now and, and portray all of this scene going on there in heaven. That'd be great. And here they are, and they're all worshiping. And we, we also noted that if the main theme of Revelation is the revealing of who Jesus Christ is, a sub-theme, a major sub-theme through the book is worship. How do we worship? Whenever we draw close to God, we are compelled to worship. If we find ourselves in a place in our Christian lives where we can't worship, 
And we all, we all go there from time to time. Let's just be honest about it, you know. There are times when we don't feel like worshiping. And we always try to identify the reason, don't we? And, and we look over here and we look over there and, you know, the preaching's not any good, the music's not any good, and the person sitting over there is a hypocrite, or, or whatever it is, that's why I can't worship. None of that's true, is it? The reason we can't worship is because we are far away from God. Because if we're close to God, we can't help but worship. And external circumstances won't make any difference, you see. You know, Paul in, in Philippians, when he talks about the peace that passes all understanding, he's saying, well, yeah, we can have that peace regardless of circumstances. And what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation is, when we draw near to God, regardless of the external circumstances, we become worshipers. Because though we live in an imperfect world and serve with imperfect people, we serve a perfect and holy God. Therefore, we can always, always find reason to worship Him. So, chapter 4 ends, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So we finished on a high note, didn't we? All the worship going on, and I can just see, you know, John standing there with his mouth open, just enthralled at what he sees. Then I saw, chapter 5, in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Can you imagine how John must have felt here he is on this huge high, this great worship experience. And now, his hopes are all dashed. No one is found in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, to open the scroll. As John looks intently on God, he sees the scroll in his right hand. Now John would have immediately thought of the scroll in Ezekiel. He would have been familiar with that book. And he would remember that Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll. The whole idea that God was giving Ezekiel the message to give to his people. And now when he sees the scroll, he, see, he would immediately think that, ah, God is going to reveal to me, so I can reveal to the churches, his plans for the future. His plan for all eternity. And in that he would be correct. But now he finds that the whole thing is going to be thwarted because there's no one who is able to break the seal. Now when we go back into antiquity and uh, we find that uh, the way messages were sent from one place to another was uh, of course with a scroll that was sealed. And the reason it was sealed is because only the person who had the authority from the one who sent the scroll could open it. And uh, when you became a person of authority in those days, you were usually given a scepter of some sort as the emblem of your authority, and you were given a ring. And the ring was uh, flat, and it would have uh, some distinctive markings on it. And so I would have my ring, and if I were going to send a message over to Portland, I'd do the scroll, I'd roll it all up, put some wax on it, and then put my seal on it. And that way, when the recipient got the scroll, if that wax seal wasn't intact, he would know that someone had tampered with it. Some unauthorized person had opened it. So John would have been very familiar with all of these things. And there's no one who is found with the authority to open the scroll. But now... We have this phrase, 
No one in heaven, no one on the earth, nor under the earth. Where do we run into that in the New Testament? We, we've seen that, that before, haven't we? We find it in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Where there's no one found, either in heaven, well in Philippians it says everyone in heaven, on the earth and under the earth, will bow down and worship Jesus Christ as Lord. So when we see that phrase, it's all inclusive. It means every human being, every creature that has ever lived, it's all inclusive and not a one of them is able to open the seal. What of God's plan? What's going to become of it? What of John's mission? His reaction is appropriate. Look at it here. And I begin to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Again, we can see the gospel unfolding in our story. Before Jesus enters our lives, we are like John. We're shut out. We don't see his plan. We can't understand his plan until Jesus shows up and the Holy Spirit reveals his plan to us and gives us entrance. Before Jesus makes himself known in our lives, we are, to use the biblical phrase, spiritually dead. Now you ask yourself, what can dead people do? The answer is simple. Nothing. We are totally helpless. We cannot help ourselves. We don't have a little bit of faith or a little bit of grace or a little bit of anything. See, grace is kind of like being pregnant. You're not a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't. And it's the same with God's saving grace and faith. You either have it because he's given it to you or you don't. And that's where John finds himself now, totally impotent to do anything about this scroll. But there's hope in Jesus Christ. We'll read on here, verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Wow. Just when it seems like all hope is lost, John is directed to look upon the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ. And so it is with us. We are awash in a sea of our own sins. We have no hope. There's no way out. And Jesus invades our lives. The Lion of Judah comes into our lives. The Spirit says to us, Behold the Lion of Judah. And we look upon Jesus. And we step through the door. And now we have life because God has given it to us. When it seems like all hope is lost, John is directed to look upon the Lion of Judah. Good news! The Gospel unfolding once again before us. In Ephesians chapter 2, the first six verses, Paul gives us an apt description of our condition before God until the Spirit invades our lives. And John's before the throne, before the Lion of Judah steps forward. Here it is. And you, that's all of us, were dead 
in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, bearing rich, being rich in mercy, because of the great love of which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. God invades dead people's lives and makes them alive. Jesus, when he was here in John chapter 11 verse 25 said this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. See, you say, well pastor, why do you harp on this thing that we were dead so much? Because we need to realize where we came from. See, we weren't just pretty much good folks that finally got God's notice and he says, well, they've done some good things. No. We were hopeless. We were dead. And God says, you know what? I'm going to go down there to that hopeless, dead individual. But like Lazarus, you know, where King James says he stinketh. He says, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to pour my spirit out on him or her and make him alive. When we realize that, we should be compelled to fall down before the throne. As John continues to look, we see this. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out unto all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Huh. Well, which is it? A lion or a lamb? The angel said, look, behold, the Lion of Judah. So he looks, and as he's looking, what does he see? He sees a lamb. So which is it? The lion becomes the lamb. It is both. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But he's also the sacrificial lamb that paid the price for all of us to go through that door, you see. You see, but it's paradoxical. The lion, the lamb, the king, the dying on the cross. Yeah, it is. But if you read scripture, it's full of paradox. It's all through there. You know, what did Jesus say? If you want to save your life, you must lose your life. You know? Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Paradox. It's okay. We can live with paradox. It's okay. The lion and the lamb. Think about it. The lion became the lamb so that we might have life. The lion of his own volition leaves his throne in heaven, comes to this earth, becomes a lamb, goes to the cross, dies, so that God may raise him up, the first fruits of many to come, and we are among the many. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. It's a marvelous thing. Ah, but this lamb looks a little different, does he not? He has seven horns. He has seven eyes. He has all these spirits. What's that all about? Never seen a lamb that looked like that. 
Now you remember though we noted early on in our study that the point isn't identify so much what Christ looks like or what these creatures looks like but what they are. So we have seven horns. Well if you're familiar with the Old Testament you know that horns are representative of power, of authority. And we, we've noted that the number seven, which shows up over and over and over and over ad infinitum in the book of Revelation, indicates fullness, completion, everything. So when we see that the lamb had seven horns, we know that the lamb has all power. The theological word is he is omnipotent. He has seven eyes. What are the seven eyes all about? What do we do with our eyes? We see. He is all-seeing. We call that, he's all-knowing. We call that omniscience. And the seven spirits is the fullness of the spirit. It's all right there. And why is that important to us? Well, because his omniscience is important to us because what does he say to the seven churches? He starts every, every letter off with, I know. He knows. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. And when he says to us, I have sealed you unto the day of redemption, we can have confidence that that will happen because he is all powerful. No one can thwart him. No one can stay his hand nor challenge him. What have you done? We talked about that last week. And the spirit that he gives to us is unconquerable. This is why our hope is sure. This is why regardless of circumstances, regardless of what we're going through, regardless of how we feel, our hope is sure. So how should we respond to all of this wonderful good news? And this is all good news, is it not? We should respond with worship. Verses 8 through 14. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, for from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures, the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow. Now we're back to this scene sort of like we had in, in chapter 4. Can you imagine John? He's privy to all this. Must have been magnificent. It must have been marvelous. Now we're not going to try to identify everything in that passage I just read, but uh, just a, a couple of things I'd point out. It talks about, they sang a new song. Again, John's mind would have immediately went to Exodus chapter 15. And it wasn't unusual, again, in those times when something happened, when you, when you experienced a great victory or some great feat was accomplished, they would compose a new song. And they would sing that song. And, and if you read Exodus chapter 15, 15. They, they have just crossed the Red Sea. The Lord has delivered them from the Egyptians, from the Egyptian army. He's destroyed them. And what does Moses do? He writes a new song. And the first time I heard this song, I thought, well, that's goofy. Until I figured out it was just scripture. <laughs> but it goes like this. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed victoriously the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord is God, and I will praise him. 
my father's God and I will exalt him. I thought, well, horse and rider thrown in the sea, that's kind of goofy. Until you realize the context. And that's just exactly what had just happened. And what was their response? To praise God. To, to recognize, to declare, the Lord is God and I will praise him. My Father is God and I will exalt him. That's pretty huge. So these guys here now are singing this new song. Pretty much using different words to say the same thing Moses said. That God is worthy to be praised. Interesting. In Exodus, God delivers a single people group. Does he not? He delivers the Israelites. It's kind of an exclusive club. They're God's people. Everybody else, not God's people. You go all through there, through the Old Testament, two groups of people. God's people, not God's people. But now, the new song they're singing here, it says he has delivered a people from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. See, when Jesus comes on the scene, he just kicks the doors wide open. And he says, whomever I call now will be my people. Whether they're Jew, Gentile, black, white, green, blue, whatever. Whatever language they speak, doesn't matter. And then look what he says. Look how many people he sees. Do we all know what a myriad is? A lot. It is. The Brian knows things. <laughs> a myriad is 10,000. So you got, you guys can do the math on this. You've got myriads upon myriads, and then you've got multiples of 10,000 more on top of all that. And you just, just, I was a history major. Uh, let me see if that's for me. I'll, I'll get it here now. Hello? Hello, Lord, is that you? <laughs> I learned that at the retreat this, this, this last week. <laughs> Somebody's phone went off, and it must have been an old guy like me, because they couldn't get it turned off. <laughs> And oh, Alistair, he, he pulled his phone. I left, providentially, I went off and left my phone on the counter this morning. But uh, Alistair pulled his phone out. Let's see if it was for him. So I told the guys, I said, the next time a phone goes off in church, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I just didn't know who my victim was going to be. <laughs> All right. So anyway, he sees all of these people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and they're all doing the same thing, and that's the important thing. They're all worshiping and praising God. Now, we do see a glimpse into the future here. In verse 13, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne to the Lamb, blessing and honor and glory and might forever. Now, why do I say that's in the future? Well, present time, present tense, is every creature praising the God and giving him glory? No, certainly not. I mean, we have people that even deny he exists. So we can't be to that point in time yet, can we? See? But we will get there. There will come a day when every creature... Now where do I get that from? Philippians chapter 2, right? The lion, now I'm paraphrasing, the lion humbled himself and became the lamb and endured the cross so that we might have salvation and therefore... God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, all of those who are in heaven, who are on the earth and under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? Okay. That day is coming. 
I don't have the foggiest when it is. It could be today. It could be a thousand years from now. We don't know. But the thing we do know is it is coming. And every knee will bow. The only question is, to whom will it bow? Will it bow to the Lion of Judah, who comes to judge the world? We're going to read about some of that. Or will it bow before the Lamb, who comes as their Savior? To whom will you bow? Only you know. You and the Holy Spirit. To those who walk through that door, to those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will joyfully bow to a loving Savior. And to those who do not, will bow to a righteous judge. Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me. And I know stuff I've done. I don't want to bow to a righteous judge. Because there's only going to be one verdict. I want to make sure I'm bowing joyfully before a loving Savior. But be sure, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what about us? What difference does it make to us? How should we respond to these two chapters, Revelation 4 and 5? The obvious answer is, become worshipers. Fall down before the throne and worship Almighty God. We begin talking about obstacles to worship. You remember? And how we try to identify them and blame it on this, that, and the other thing. You know what the biggest obstacle to worship is? Pogo, the great theologian Pogo, has given us the answer. We have met the biggest obstacle to us being worshipers and it is us. The biggest thing that keeps Pastor Darrell from worshiping God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength is me. Okay. And why is that? Well, it's because I'm a fallen, selfish, sinful person. And I don't keep my eye on the prize. Remember Paul talked about keeping our eye on the prize. The prize is Jesus Christ, the throne room of God. And I get it on everything else. I was going to show a little film clip today, uh, but I thought it might be too much for you on, as I thought it over. But anyways, this guy they, they call the Pentecostal powerhouse. I'll, I'll, you know, you can learn from anybody. And he has this big tirade he was going off on about about what keeps us from worshiping. And he, he, I couldn't, I can't do it like him, so I won't try to do it. But he just points out all these things, you know. And it's the I. You know, I went to church today, and I didn't like this, and I didn't like that, and they didn't do this the way I thought it should be done, and they didn't do this, and I wanted that, and I wanted this, and this, I, 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 I. That's why we're not worshipers. Now, grant you, some of us are worse than others, but we all struggle with that. And as we get over it, as God keeps chipping away at it on this journey we call uh, growth, as we become more and more Christ-like in our walk, the eye begins to fade and God begins to increase and we become worshipers. The biggest obstacle to worship is myself, my preferences, my desires, my feelings. When the Bible tells us, it doesn't matter where we're at, it doesn't matter what's going on, we should be able to draw near to the throne room of God and worship. Another reason it's so hard for us to do that is, and it's, it's just part of the human condition, and I think in our modern society, it's even worse than usual, is we have, we don't really believe God is who God is. And the reason we don't 
it's difficult because we have believed in so many things that have let us down. You know, there's some people believe in, in government. They put all their faith in government and it lets us down. Sometimes we believe in people and we put all our faith in this person and we, we bear ourselves before them and they let us down. Our faith is, is dashed. We, we, we put our faith in technology. God help us all. <laughs> and what happens? It lets us down. And so our faith has been dashed so many times because we put it in things that aren't omnipotent, that aren't omniscient, that aren't all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, that it's hard for us to truly believe that God is God and will do what He says He's going to do. But He will, let me assure you. There is no doubt. So to paraphrase Paul, I urge you by the mercies of God to fall down before the throne and worship the king. Worship the king. The door to eternal life is open. If you've not walked through it, there's a reason you're here. There's a reason you've heard this message. Holy Spirit is saying, hey, the door is open. Walk through it. Most of you here, I'm sure, have gone through that door. Well, if you've gone through that door, you're in the presence of God. Draw near to the throne and worship. Enjoy it. Think about what John's seeing. It's all there for us. All because God loved us. Even though we stinketh. Pray with me. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much that you are the great, almighty, powerful God. Thank you that you are uh, returning to this earth and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Of all. Not just of those who believe in you, but of all. And so, Lord, if there's anyone here who has not become a citizen of your kingdom, I would, I would just encourage them right now in the quietness of their heart to say, Yes, Jesus, I want to go through that door and know that it's done. And for those of us that have made that decision, Lord, help us to remember that you will keep every promise you have ever made, that we are yours and no one, no one, nothing, can take us out of your hand. And for that we are forever grateful. We fall down before you, Lord, and worship you as worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.